Hello and welcome back to the Undercut Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Seema Was Daily, and today I am joined once again by my more than capable co-host, Mr. Jesse Billington. How are you today? I'm doing very well. Um, busy day over at the offices in Peterborough, uh, putting together Classic Car Weekly, doing all things classic and car. But yeah, otherwise uh, prepped and ready to talk all things Formula 2. Excellent stuff. We're also joined today by a friend of the podcast and feeder series connoisseur, Jacob Phillips. How are you? I'm doing very good, thanks, Timo. And feeder series connoisseur, I might have to stick that on my CV. That sounds rather spiffing, doesn't it? It does, rather. I thought you might appreciate that. And now, the reason I've gathered you both here today, as Jesse alluded to, is that we finally have a full list of drivers for the Formula 2 2023 season. So we're going to go team by team and discuss who's where, what we think of the choices that have been made, and who we wished was on the grid but sadly isn't. And if those of you listening have indeed listened to our Game of Thrones-style F2 episode that was out midway through last season, you know that the three of us won't be holding back with our opinions here. And quite frankly, we know you wouldn't want us to. So I'm going to just going to kick things off straight away and in no particular order, jump to MP Motorsport. I'm going to run through the two drivers they've got and a couple of bits of the information that we have on them. And then, Jesse, I'm coming to you first for your opinions. So MP Motorsport, we have Dennis Hauger who is going to be in his second season this year. He's got two wins last year in Monaco and Baku, plus two more podiums, and was, of course, F3 champion in 2021, and then finished P10 overall in Formula 2 last year. And partnering him is Jayhan Druvler, who had one win last year in Monza, plus seven podiums to get into P7 overall in the standings last year. What do you make of all of that? I think it's interesting. Obviously, MP Motorsport won. Uh, well, they won the drivers' title last year, didn't they? With um, they did. Mr. Uh, Drogovic, Felipe Drogovic, and of course, they've also seen Clement Novak jump ship, which is interesting. So potentially, Clem knows what's going on inside the team that suggested he should jump ship as opposed to stick with what's proven to be a winning formula, or potentially he's had a more inviting offer somewhere else. Which so that suggests there's possibly something going on at the team whether that's good or bad has yet to be proven but Dennis Hauger is he's a fine little wheelsmith that's for certain he had a very good campaign through F3 and made a good start to his F2 career last year with some like you said some decent wins and some podiums to go with that so it'll be interesting to see what he can get from what was at least last year a very good car very good team very good sort of structure a hierarchy means of running the system so there's a lot of promise there equally he's now coming up against a sort of familiar face on the Formula 2 grid, Jayhan Deruvula. He's been around for a couple of seasons now. We only had the one win last year, but quite a handful of podiums to go with it. So, yeah, they finished close in the standings last year. You could argue that they are equivocal drivers. Um, whether we see that in equal machinery is a different matter. So uh, time will tell. But uh, my hopes are high for the MP Motorsports team. They're quite a fun and enjoyable team to have on the on the F2 field. And should throw something interesting into the mix this year, I think, with this driver lineup. Jacob, I want to say to you that as kind of a rebuttal to Jesse that I'll let you answer there, Clement Novelak saying about maybe he leave, but maybe he was pushed given how he did in comparison to, yes, okay, the champion last year, but he finished way down in the standing. So maybe not a case of seeing that there's something going on in the team and more leave before you're pushed. And Jan Ruvler on the other hand as well, Yes, seasoned driver, but only be three places away from Dennis Hauger in his rookie season. How does that reflect on him? And what will we see from him this year, do you think, as well as the as well as when he is Formula E reserve drive for Mahindra Racing? Oh, carry on with what Jesse said there. Uh, MP as a team, I quite like MP as a team. They sort of uh, come up through the ranks, haven't they? They were never sort of challenging for the title in the last few years before last year. So it was a pleasant surprise, and I'm glad they did win the title with uh, Drogovic. But I was, uh, well, you're reading my mind there, Timo, with what you said, actually. I was more going to aim towards the point of uh, Novelak being pushed. I don't think he's been offered a better deal down at Trident. I don't think that Trident will be anywhere near MP in the standings, although I could be proven wrong. It's F2. So I think he was more pushed rather than he knows something else or he's got a better deal. Um, Deruvla. What do I think of Deruvla? Deruvla. He's, he's there or thereabouts, isn't he? But he's obviously now not part of the Red Bull Junior Academy. That doesn't bode well for his future. I think he'll be a consistent, solid driver. But it's going to be interesting to see how he matches up against Hauger. And Hauger disappointed me last year, actually. 
Um, I famously said a few years ago, I think in 2021, that by 2024, um, Howard would be uh, fronting up in Alpha Tauri. So he's still got to prove that this year. You know, he could. He could win the championship. Who knows? We could be seeing him lying up on F1 next year. But I think it'll be interesting to see how they match up. I think they'll be fairly closely matched. And I think Hauger, like we say, has got a lot more to prove. So I think Hauger, out of both of those two, will be going for the title. I don't see Deruvla doing much, barring the odd win and odd podium really but it'd be interesting to see how they, they match up Jesse then gut instinct Helga or Deruvla finishing on top of the other this year I think it's going to definitely be Helga finishing ahead of Deruvla a man for whom both Jacob and I take hairstyle inspiration from I think <laughs> but at the same time um, he, yeah we've both sort of championed him as a driver and I think yeah Jacob's idea of him being on the F1 grid by 20, 2024 isn't overly far-fetched, especially if you're looking at that Alpha Tauri seat, where they might not be getting rid of Nick DeVries, but if Yuki Snowder has a rough season, there's possibly going to be a seat that opens up, and Dennis Halgo would be a surefire shot for it, especially if he performs nicely this year. What's, what's your opinions before we shuffle on? Otherwise, you're going to get shafted from this rather quickly. No, I'm, I'm. this is going to be one of those times where I do not have much to say because I completely agree with, with both of you on that one. I think Halgo is going to be the better of the two drivers, and... I'll be very surprised of the fact that if we see Druvla in Formula 2 next year at all, even if he finishes in the top five this year, he needs an absolutely stonking year and he really needed one last year and he didn't really have it. So it is, again, one of those, like many of the drivers in the field this year, it's a make or break year and arguably if it isn't a make year or even close to one, then it should be uh, time to shuffle out and make room for some for some new blood next year. Mm. Of Deruvla, before we move on to the next team, I don't want to say that he'll shuffle off into ubiquity because he obviously has this Formula E link with Mahindra Racing. And I don't want to speak ill of Formula E because I think there is a lot of potential with that series. And we've only seen one race weekend so far with the new Series 3 cars, but it, it it's getting better every time. They seem to be taking sort of two steps forward, one step back with things that they're attempting or with their doing. So there is a lot of promise there and we could see good drivers move over to it as a series to enjoy it so there is scope for Jayan to move on and do something interesting but I, I don't think Formula 1 is going to be his end point regardless of how well or poorly he does this season I think no, I Formula E is def- definitely getting better because if anyone knows me I'm not the biggest fan but even I tuned into the first race so they must be doing something right but I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't um, yeah I think Deruvla will be moving into Formula E, maybe even look at the IndyCar programme, who knows, Indy Lights, maybe, or NXT, as, as they now call it, but yeah, I don't um, think we'll see him in F1, surely not. Meanwhile, over in the newly rebranded Rodin Carlin team, we have two familiar faces for long-time feeder series fans, and Enzo Fittipaldi, who got six podiums last year and finished in P8 overall, which is interesting, only one place behind Deruvla there, with not any wins to his name. And then we have our first rookie on this list in India's indeed, the boy from Barbados, Zane Maloney, who has also, you'll be glad to know, cottoned onto that as something that he is known for now and has really brought it into his own personal branding. So I'm loving that. He got three wins in Formula 3 last year, plus one podium and finished in P2 overall. Quite an exciting lineup for me personally, I think. Enzo Capaldi. We like him as a group, from what I recall, and I did not forget him this time in this episode, so I'm fixing that immediately. And Zay Maloney, yeah, just very quick little man, so I'm very much looking forward to see how that translates over to F2, because as we've seen with many an F3 driver, it's not going to be a guarantee that just because you do well there, you will do well in Formula 2. So... Very much interested, and I think it's a it's a stronger lineup than MP Motorsport overall as a as a team. I agree with you on it being a stronger lineup. Fittipaldi, I feel, has come into his own, especially a lot through last season. It wasn't a perfect season from him, but I think he learned a lot from it not being perfect, from occasionally having to struggle against things. He's learned a hell of a lot, and that's going to line him up to be a very competitive and structured driver he's going to know how to put together a championship fight he's going to know how to deal with things think strategically through things i think that's definitely going to come into his sort of field of play through this season um yeah six podiums decent little run of things i reckon we're probably going to see at least one fittipaldi win this season in f2 that's that's pretty much a certainty um i'm going to do something stupid and say i reckon it will be in something like spa as well I don't know. I, it strikes me as that's where it's going to happen, possibly because we had um, oh, who used to be for Carlin last season? Um, what's his face? The Kiwi. He Mark, not Mark Armstrong. Liam Lawson. Liam, Liam Lawson. Liam Lawson. 
he won at Spa as well. And I just feel that there's going to be some sort of strange similarity that we're going to see it happen again. But Zane Maloney, the boy from Barbados, everyone's favourite Barbudan, um, it's going to be an interesting season for him starting in Formula 2. He is against a very ferocious grid at the top end of things. There's some chaotic midfield with some drivers that really should have shuffled on by this point and a good wealth of rookies that are moving up. If he can prove himself to be a fast learner and one that's adept at moving up to this new series, he will do well. And I don't have doubts that he will. I think he's uh, he's got his sights set and he's been focused. So it's a good time to be Zayn Maloney. I mean, question for you then, Jacob. Who's finishing on top in that team? I was about to come out with something really wacky there. I'm going to say that Zayn Maloney gets more wins than Fittipaldi, but they both have really good seasons. I just think that Maloney sort of... Um, it was, it was a sort of a raw talent last year, but he was very, very quick over the course of the season. You know, I just... I saw him at Spa. He was fantastic. I think that I didn't really know much about him actually before he came into F3, but I think he'll be a Fittipaldi run for his money. But then again, we forget Fittipaldi. Sort of, you know, last year he went under the radar and I can't remember exactly how many points finishes he got, but he was very consistent with those. As you say, there's six podiums as well. So I think that, yeah, it might be a case that Maloney gets more wins, but Fittipaldi's more consistent. And as we know the, how the feeder series work, consistency is key. I know that's a cliche term. We've used it several times on this podcast already, but hey, it's a winning formula. So I think that Fittipaldi will finish ahead of Maloney, but Maloney will get more wins. Interesting. I'm going to just, for the sake of variety, say Fittipaldi will end up on top, but it'll be a narrow. It'll be a narrow one. It'll be a very close into team battle there. Mm, I can't see Maloney beating Fittipaldi in this season, but like it would close run, certainly. There'll be points where you sort of go, Ooh, that's spicy. But I think overall, the sort of just sort of get through it, get it done, get some points sort of mentality of Fittipaldi will shine through towards the end of the day. And he'll make some big moves. There'll be, a, a like I said, there'll probably be a win and there'll be some big moments. But it the rest of it, he will just simply fly under the radar. And that I think is good for some of your feeder series, but he also needs to look at making a name for himself and having those big moments that make the F1 teams and things like your IndyCar teams, your WEC team look up and go, ooh, you look interesting. You look like someone we should put in the seat. And that's something he should look at building into his campaign this season for certain. I'm pretty Talking sure that that um, water park in uh, Barbados will be rubbing their hands all that sponsorship he's going to get. It's, it's not a water park. It's a racetrack, I thought. It's a ra- of course. It's a ra- Why do I think it's a wa- the racetrack? <laughs> that's, that's coming later in the year, Jacob, when he does really well and they can start adding bits and pieces to it. That's what, that's what happens when maybe climate change maybe kicks in. If we don't support Formula E enough, eventually Bushy Park just becomes a big swimming pool like the rest of Barbados. Why did I think it was a swimming pool? Well, I knew it, it sounded fun. So I just Can we sure. clip that for the teaser, Jesse? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Zane. <laughs> Talking of interesting things, though, ART have what could be quite a spicy lineup. It's reminding me of what, well, obviously, not on the same level. It gives me Sebastian Vettel, Daniel Ricciardo vibes in Porsche being Vettel and. Victor Martins coming in as the Daniel Ricciardo figure to unsurp him. Because we've got Teo Porcher, who had three wins and four podiums in 2022, finishing P2 overall. But there is a pretty big asterisk next to that as he finished 99 points behind Drogovic in P1. And he's going to be coming into his third season in Formula 2 now. And if you're him, you've got to win it because... You were very strong in Formula 3. You had a very strong debut year in Formula 2 and then kind of just tapered off and all that kind of buzz and excitement that was around him, a lot of it is still there, but it's waning slightly, I feel like. And if there's anyone who's going to cause you a bit of trouble, it's going to be the most recent Formula 3 champion in Victor Martin. So you've got two wins last year and four podiums, echoing what Jacob was saying earlier, and that consistency is key. You do not need to win all the time to be champion. And that could be quite the recipe for some fireworks, I think, in 2023. I think it will be a rather spicy relationship. Well, it'll be interesting to see, obviously, they're both French drivers at French team. Um, Paul Chair, so it's a, it's a very big year for him. I think if he doesn't win this year, then it's not going to be looking good for his F1 prospects. I think he'll be gunning for the title. Whether he gets it or not is another matter, but he will certainly be up there. I think one thing he's got to, you know, stay focused, and I think he's been, been criticised of being a little bit overconfident over the last few years. Not too sure he was maybe too happy about being in F3 or F2, sorry, for a third year. So we'll see how that plays in his mind. And, you know, he's got to, you've got to have, you know, 
two eyes firmly on his mirrors because Victor Martins, among other drivers, are going to be right there. So it's going to be interesting to see. I'm sure they're not going to be best of friends. I'm sure we're going to see a few few radio calls about pushing drivers off the tracks and things like that. I think it's going to be quite a spicy relationship. But I think poor chair over the course of the season will just have enough to finish ahead of Martins. But Martins will be up there, I think. And he'll certainly pick up a few wins as well. I was very impressed with him last year. But I don't think he'll win the title, but poor chair could. I'm going to echo those sentiments. I think Porsche, this is Porsche's do or die year. That's uh, pretty much a sort of obvious statement. He's got to do it this year. Otherwise, he's going to IndyCar. I think there's there's no easy way of putting it. Don't diss IndyCar like that. I'm not dissing IndyCar, but what happens... Someone says it's a good thing. It, it's a good thing. I like IndyCar. Don't get me wrong. Brilliant series, brilliant racing, some really cool like circuits. I like it. <laughs> I also like it a huge amount because that's where Roman Grosjean is and my love for that man will never die. But that's not the point. The fact of the matter is that his, it, you come into Formula 2, your end game is, generally speaking, Formula 1. IndyCar, in that instance, almost doesn't necessarily... I'm not going to say it's a downgrade or anything, but it, it's not the thing you've aimed for. I'm glad you didn't say that deliberately then, but you just mentioned no, it. No, it's not the time. <laughs> it's, it, it's just that awkward thing of you've aimed so long for doing something. It's like sort of saying you want to do medicine and you end up doing nursing. And again, that sounds really terrible because I'm on strike. <laughs> I'm putting my foot in every trap that's laid out. It's... <laughs> You're, put, you're aiming for something that's so high in the upper stratum that because it's so high that even if you don't get, if you get close... What I'm loving here, failure. Jacob, is he just keeps digging. He doesn't realise that he should have just stopped about five minutes ago. You've dug so far, Jess, you're nearly in Australia and you'll probably be there in time for the Grand Prix in April. I, I'm got heading back. I think my visa's still, um, still valid. Um, but it, it, the fact <laughs> is with Formula 1, it's such a high bar to aim for that it makes failing easy. You, it's so tricky to get into one of 20 seats in Formula 1 where the standard to get into it is give or take Lance Stroll quite high and if you don't get into that it's very easy to, for things to feel like a failure and I think for Porsche that's something he's got to get his head around this year is a case of that is a very high bar he is aiming for but he's also got to have some level of I don't want to say realism because that sounds like a bit of faith in his abilities but some level of caution that there's going to have to be something that follows this Formula 2 season and it's unlikely to be another Formula 2 season so there's a lot of pressure mounting on it this this year, it's what I'm aiming to say I think and it echoes back to what Jacob was saying on the whole balance out that overconfidence that you might have had last year and just because you did well in F3 and you did well in your season doesn't automatically guarantee that you will do well again especially when you've got like Oscar Piastri before coming in and showing everyone how it's done when you've got likes of Felipe Drogovic then coming in like, oh yeah, the more experienced drivers can come and do this. It's not always going to be the young guns, but then you have Victor Martins there again to balance it out. Mm. It shows that at, just like in Formula 3, nothing is, is guaranteed and you really need to be on the top of your game all the time and you can't be taking any liberties with that. Yeah, I think what Porsche is in the situation that Drogovic was in last year on the case of this is possibly your last chance to do this in Formula 2. You're going to have to do it. And Drogovic was fortunate enough that he had pretty much the entirety both sides of that MP Motorsport garage behind him supporting him doing it and he had the right headspace to get into it if Porsche can do that with ART get all of them behind him 100% and get himself trained to a level where he is regardless of what goes on around him in that headspace he can do it I have faith in his technical and racing ability to do it it's there's the other factors that come into being a racing driver not simply being able to turn the car left right and put your foot on the accelerator when it comes to victor martens he doesn't have as much to prove so he's more likely to be throwing caution to the wind and he's sort of in that almost lewis hamilton in his first f1 season going to not so carefree but the wins that come to him will be fantastic wins because it'll be that proof that even if things aren't necessarily going his way he can still prove that things can go his way if he needs them to. Jacob, then Martins or Porsche? Porsche, just because he's got the experience, I think. But it might be closer than we think. Although Porsche could... It's a, it's a hard one, but I'm going to say yeah, Porsche. <laughs> I'm going to say Porsche. I don't think Martins is going to come close. Um, but I reckon there'll be moments where Porsche doesn't have a good day of things. And all of a sudden you're looking at Martins and going, hello, what are you up to there? And there'll be eyebrows raised. I'll keep things interesting and say Martens. But again, talking of interesting, Prima, we have Frederick Vesti returning to the team after he was with them back in Formula 3. He finished P9 overall last year with one win in Baku and four podiums to his name. He's going to be joined by 
kind of a favourite of ours collectively from Formula 3 last year, rookie there in Formula 2 this year, Oli Behrman, one win at Spa last year, plus seven podiums, putting him in P3 in the standings last year. So interesting little team there. Vesti, for me, there's a lot of potential there. He's obviously tied with Mercedes. What happens there is anyone's guess at the moment, but he's not set the world on fire just yet. He's got a lot of potential, but it's not really come through as if he was Oli Behrman. Still very early days, but looking quite promising. And P3 overall in, in the standings for Formula 3 is pretty good. I think I said in one of our F3 review episodes towards the end last year that I would prefer him to stay there for another year to, to hone that a bit. But I could also see why he was promoted in Prem as a pretty good place for him to go. So... I'm going to be, I don't know which way to call that one, to be honest, because you've got the raw talent for Behrman coming in there, but you've got the potential of Vesti that's got to come to fruition at some point because Mercedes don't pick drivers that don't cut it. So it's a, it's a toss up for me at the moment on that one. Jesse, you look like you've got something to say. I wouldn't be surprised if we see Behrman beat out Vesti this season. I can see for some reason Frederick drops the ball. It might be a case of he just wasn't ready for something. He didn't think he was going to have to fight as much as he did or things just go wrong. It's out of his control. But I can see there being some sort of a ball drop that leads to Behrman taking not necessarily control of the team, but taking control of the situation between the two of them and becoming out, not lead driver, but the guy that ends up on top just out of skill, luck, being able to put himself in the right place at the right time. As much as everyone goes, oh, it was lucky to be where he was at that moment in time, you've got to get yourself into those moments for when they happen in Formula 1, Formula 2 and Formula 3. You've got to be the guy that's behind two cars that are going to wipe each other out. You've got to get yourself into those positions. And Behrman seems to have a good knack for that. He seems to have an ability to sort of place himself very well. And I think in the chaos of F2, that's going to Play, pay out quite nicely for certain and it's likely going to show up Vesti by my call I like both drivers actually I think both drivers are very capable we've both seen how they did in F3 Vesti had a, a he had a solid enough year last year picked up obviously that win in Baki which is no mean feat obviously it's a very hard track to win around so that's quite impressive in itself I saw Behrman win the flesh in Spa which is also a very impressive drive so I'm with team on this one. Um, it's going to be a bit of a toss-up. I'm not too sure who's going to finish ahead. Although I just think Vesti will, just because Behrman, he finished third, but Prem is, a, Prem is always a very good car in F3. You know, I know the cars are very similar, but Prem always seem to, you know, come up with a car that's always better suited, let's say. So I think... Prima have found it a little bit tougher in Formula 2 over the last couple of years. They used to be the all-dominant force. So I think that Behrman might take a little bit of time to adapt. Obviously, it's a very competitive field anyway. So I think that experience that Vessi has, just that one-year experience in a team that's you know very capable anyway, will just shine through. But it could go either way. But I'm going to say Vesti on this one, but within sort of 50 points. So within a couple of wins, maybe, or a few podiums. But I think Vesti just, just shades it. I'm going to say Vesti as well, just for the fact of he's returning to a team where he did very well in Formula 3 and the change didn't work for whatever reason in Formula 2, but he was still doing fairly well. So maybe that return to somewhere a bit more comfortable is exactly what he needs. But again, Berman, if he continues that strong role pace, especially the like we saw in Spa and Monza towards the end of last year, um, then it could be very close. Or maybe that's it's not close between the two of them at all because they're too busy fighting everyone else. But who knows? But high-tech, however, interesting driver choices for me here. Two rookies, both from Formula 3 from last year, one of which for me is more justifiable than the other. And again, I like both drivers, but it's, again, that age-old thing of just because you like a driver doesn't mean that they should be here, there, or anywhere. So first up, we've got Jack Crawford, who got one win last year in Austria, plus four podiums to his name, and finished P7 overall in Formula 3. Partnering him is Isaac Hadjar, who Red Bull quite like the look of him these days, and not just because he's one of their million junior drivers. He got three wins last year in Bahrain, Silverstone, and Austria, plus another two podiums to finish P4 overall. Now, my general rule... Granted, I disagreed with myself already in the past on that a bunch of drivers who didn't win in F3 last year, didn't win the title, rather should stay in F3 for another season, really get to grips with that before moving up to F2 because of the level of difficulty changes from one to the other. But I can I can stomach Hadjar moving up there. But I think if you're outside the top five, it starts to get a little questionable. So I think Jack Crawford, whilst nice guy, 
bit of a risk. What are we thinking, Jacob? Um, well, you say that obviously if you don't finish the top five, then maybe you should be on the grid. But then again, there are drivers coming down this list that didn't get anywhere near Zach Crawford, but that might come down to money as well. But I think that, you know, I think that we, we've seen before that another extra year in F3 doesn't exactly hurt. And I think with that experience he had after one year, I think he could have built on that one win and potentially maybe even won the championship in F3 and then sort of come up the ranks for next year, which would have been potentially better for his career outlook. So the one thing I'm worried about for Jack Crawford is it's maybe a bit too early for him, really. And I think that Hajar, you know, he finished above him in the championship anyway last year. But I think Hajar, I said last year that I think he's, I think he could be something special. You know, three wins in F3 is very impressive in itself. Red Bull rate him highly. And if there was a driver that was going to come through from that program up to F1, then it might be him. But yeah, it's a very interesting choice. But I think as, yeah, Jack Crawford, potentially a little bit too early. But it'd be a shame for him if, you know, that decision to bring him up was to his detriment and we see him flounder a bit. But I think he'll be solid enough. I don't think we'll see Crawford pick up a win. We'll see him pick up a couple of podiums. I think Hajar will pick up a few wins and um, could potentially dominate Jack Crawford. But we'll see what happens there. I put it to you, Jesse, as both of them are Red Bull junior drivers, is that more of the reason that they both made the step up? Because Hadra, like I said before, favourites, he's got a lot of favourable stuff said about him by both O'Connor and Marco Crawford as being, he's not been around for ages, but again, it's just kind of, he's part of that, that giant machine that is the Red Bull junior academy. Are they putting him there to try and push him and see what he can do? Because they've got so many other drivers waiting below so that they can chop and replace if need be or am i being even harsher than mr marco himself i think you're fair in the idea that red bull are using their wealth of junior drivers to sort of push them and find out what each of them can do hadjar in this instance he's going to swim i there's out of the single swim options he's definitely going to be the one that swims and swims his way to i think any more than two wins in your rookie season in f2 is pushing it it's probably doable for certain. We've seen guys come in and win the F2 championship as rookies. But I think we're given how competitive the field is looking this year, it's that's a big ask. Um, Crawford, I don't think we'll have quite the same fate as Hadjar coming into F2. Again, I think it's a little early for Crawford. One more year in F3, a chance to get into that top five, top four, possibly even a sort of P2 finish overall in F3 would do him very nicely and get him into a proper sort of mindset and a race set to approach F2. But Hadjar showed that he had this sort of uncanny raw talent for finding his way through a field, which is a large amount of what F2 needs you to do, especially with, again, it's chaotic reverse grids or flipping the top half of the grid. You you need to be able to fight your way through those situations. And he's a quick qualifier, so he's got the two elements you need to do well in Formula 2. This will be start the start of the proving ground as to whether or not he can prove himself in the next two to three years to be a good driver for F1. And I think the real challenge when it comes to Red Bull seats will be more a case of Hauger versus Hadjar in the years to come. In the next two years, it will certainly come down to possibly those two. It won't matter for Red Bull seats anyway, because Ricardo will get that. Yeah, I mean, all Perez has to do is sneeze slightly wrong and Ricardo's getting that one, but... Eh. Another Off interesting uh, decision, though, is the one made by Dams in terms of one driver who we can definitely see why they're there, and the other one, it's a little bit of a gamble. So we've got a Yumo Wasava, who, again, we all love as a podcast, and even Ellie May absolutely loves Yumo Wasava, and she doesn't even know who he is. Um, he had two wins to his name last year in France and Abu Dhabi, plus four podiums to finish P5 overall. And... Uh, it's very much sticking up his end of the bargain to try and make my all Japanese Alpha Tauri team come true. But Yuki is kind of letting the side down on that one, unfortunately. But at least we've got Owasa waiting in the wings for, for when maybe he would replace Yuki next year and partner to freeze. I could see that happening. With him, though, we've got another rookie, this time Arthur Leclerc, who got one win last year at Silverstone, plus a podium finished P6 overall. But for me, Jesse, smacks a little bit of Ralph Schumacher. He's... Yeah, he's the unfortunate Prince Harry in this regard, isn't he? He's he's not the heir, he is spare. And I thought you were going to go Monty Python there and go, he's not the Messiah. <laughs> he's certainly not the Messiah, but he's not a naughty boy either. He's a good little driver. He's got a talent there. 
But I, the problem is he is, again, he's following in the footsteps of a successful name ahead of him. Although it's still weird to think that Charles Leclerc only has five race wins to his name. Um, it always seems strangely low. But yeah, it's you're following on from a, a driver that is so loved in Formula One. There's a lot of pressure on you, both from the social side of it, to be the nice guy, the, the guy that everyone likes in Charles Leclerc, the, is what they want to see in Arthur. But equally... Charles is a brilliant racing driver. He has a fantastic race craft. You, by name association, immediately start to expect that from the same uh, from a sibling, which I think is unfair. I'm an older sibling, so it's not something I potentially live through. But you, there is that sort of onus that you're able to do exactly the same thing your sibling does. So there's a lot of pressure on him from that regard. And I think moving up to F2 at this moment is possibly a step too early. Um, there could be a good racing driver if nurtured from him properly from F3. But this just feels like sort of throwing him in the deep end and going, if he dies, he dies sort of. And I don't think that's quite fair to the talent that's available. On the other side of the dam's garage, Iwasa, like we said, podcast uh, favourite really quick qualifier he was getting into his stride when it came to qualifying sessions towards the tail end of last season and that was starting to pay dividends when it came to races as well so there is a lot of talent that is starting to come through and a good bit of driver coaching from Iwasa if Red Bull spent a bit of time sort of teaching him how to be better that's not to say there's anything wrong with him but if they could find a way of sort of improving what he's got as natural talent they could have a very useful driver on their hands and Mm, I think Red Bull are going to do well with Iwasa and I know Arthur has got links to Ferrari Driver Academy which has a brilliant habit of frittering away talent. Look at what happened to Lance Stroll he was Ferrari Driver Academy and now he can't even avoid Fernando Alonso on a racetrack I think that's just Lance Stroll not necessarily anything to do with Ferrari though but I put it to you then Jacob P6 stick to my rule of P5 and above you get a curse into F2 if not don't care for P6 you stayed there for another year he should be staying there for another year, regard, even if he finished P5. I think that, you know, his results on track weren't, weren't anything special again in the Prima team. I think we've said it for a couple of seasons now. I just don't think he's ready for F2. And I'm going to go out as, you know, as far as I, you know, I'm going to go out and say it. I don't think he's a good enough driver anyway. Obviously, as Jesse mentioned there, he's got the surname pressure, which doesn't help. But if you take that surname away, he's just an ordinary bog standard driver. And I really don't see what the hype is about him. But I think that hype is slowly, once people have sort of peeled that surname back a bit, I think people are starting to realise that maybe he isn't the talent his brother is. And, you know, that's OK. You know, he's, he's Charles, the fantastic driver. But I think that, um, yeah, it's slightly early for him. And I think as... Jesse mentioned before the single swim option. I think he's going to need some armbands because he's heading to the deep end and the wave machine's on and he's going to drown. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, if Ferrari want to cling on to him and say, look, we've got both the Leclerc's racing, they better chuck Arthur into a GT car sometime soon, GT or endurance, because that's he, he will do well there. He's a good enough driver. And I think that the world of GT offers more to him. And equally, it gives Ferrari a vastly more marketable item than saying, look, look at what Charles Leclerc is doing. He's won the 2023 championship. What's his brother up to? Pay no attention to the younger brother. Um, it's... It, it, yeah, to for his own shame to avoid being the one that's shuffled off into a cupboard or thrown onto the dog's water bowl, he sort of probably ought to look at his options elsewhere beyond possibly another two seasons in Formula 2. I put it to you before we move on, Jesse, that is the reason you're saying all that about working GT cars simply because of Ferrari putting Giovinazzi in there and you've suddenly decided that you like those categories a lot more? <laughs> Antonio Giovinazzi arriving in endurance racing has nothing to do with my suddenly reinvigorated approach to um, the WEC series. Antonio Giovinazzi coming into it is a good thing for it in my regard. I'm, I'm looking forward to a combination of all these exciting things, plus more Antonio Giovinazzi in my life. He helps beef up the numbers, that's for certain. Virtuosi, <laughs> meanwhile, have Jack Doohan, who got three wins in 2022, should have been four, Abu Dhabi, cough, Abu Dhabi. Um, Silverstone, Budapest and Spa were all confirmed race wins, though, plus three podiums, P6 overall. Whereas, other driver in the garage, which, if he hadn't had his best finish of P5 in Abu Dhabi, I wonder if we'd still be seeing him, because he finished P17 overall in the championship last year. Amori Cordillo, oh. Jacob... Let it rip. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. I mean, you couldn't have two opposite ends of the coin, could you? Imagine a seesaw, it's going to be really, really topsy turvy there. Um, 
Uh, do you know what? I'm going to say, even if he didn't get that P5 finish, you know, he must have some money behind him because I don't know really what he's doing there. One P5 finish shouldn't save a, save a driver's career in, in a certain formula. I think that, you know, he's just a poor driver. There wasn't really anything that, you know, he was seconds down at, on times in qualifying, I think. And he got banned for a race last year. <laughs> oh, I forget that. Yeah, he got banned as well. Oh, my God. Yeah. I don't know really what he's doing on that grid. And certainly being a team with sort of championship pedigree, like Virtuosi, who, you know, had won championships before. And I think Jack Dewan will go for the championship. We'll get onto in a minute. But I do not know what Amory Cordill is doing on a grid. Jesse? <laughs> I don't have anything to add that's polite and podcastable with regards to Amory Cordial's performance last year and my aspirations for his performance this year. In fact, if anything, my aspirations for his performance this year are to not be as cack, I think is the best way of putting it in a in a in a way that we can put on the internet without getting taken down or moderated. He left a lot to be desired. And I think against Jack Dewan this year, if Virtuosi get their act together and make sure the car has always got four wheels securely bolted to it before it leaves its pit box, Cordiel is going to look like a bit of a plum come the end of the season. He's unfortunately going to be the Clement Novelak to um, Jack Dewan's Drew You took the words right out of my mouth. I was about to say they're doing an excellent MP motorsport strategy from last year and having one excellent driver and we filled a second seat. Yeah. And that's not to speak ill of Clement Overlack. Very nice guy, and I keep messaging him. Asking Being nice on podcast. doesn't mean that you can do stuff. <laughs> I'm only saying that to appease Ellie May, who is also a big Clement Overlack fan. You two need to get your blinkers sorted so that you can see the wider picture. You kind of have the same sense and logic as Sharoos, which are no longer Sharoos, but a PHM Racing, who were <clears throat> talking of not polite ways to say what the heck they've done. Roy Nassani's Back again. P19 oh. overall with the best finish of P4 in Imola after chucking away the race lead. It might be added in quite amusing and spectacular style and nearly killing, was it Helga in Silverstone over the sausage curbs that he was launching? I think it was. Um, it was Helga, yeah. So, automatically, yes, we should sign him back up. And going with him is another perfect example, Jesse, just to hammer this point home, that Brad Benavides is a nice guy. I've had a chat with him. Nice guy. But, rookie for Formula 2 after being in Formula 3 for one season with one points finish he got three points all season and was P23 overall doesn't mean you get the promotion into any other form of sport you need to stay in F3 and I do wonder if there is some kind of motto that PHM Racing has that just says we're here because we don't want to win uh, it's the Roy Nassani thing, I don't understand. I can potentially see some sense with how Brad Benavidez got this seat. I appreciate there's going to be sponsors' contracts. Yeah, there's going to be, yeah, there's no easy way of walking around the idea of it being finance. And I think that's the same thing that's just about pulling this Nassani, Nassani shtick. But yeah, I just money. don't get how he keeps appearing because he's proven that he's not a good racing driver. Why does someone keep looking? You must need the money so desperately that you keep looking at him and going, go on then, get back in the car. It's infuriating because it's a waste of a good seat. And we've got things like W Series that's teetering on the edge of complete collapse. There's no word of it coming back for 2023, despite the fact they cut their 2022 season short to save money. Um, so we've got a brilliant crop of drivers sitting there, many of which you could possibly drop into F2. Certainly some of them more... You'd be no ex- worse off. And you'd be no worse off. If anything, you'd have a better driver. You might not be financially as well off because for some reason, nobody sponsors women in motorsport. Different argument, different podcast entirely. But well, the would have had is- the money. Some of them would have done. Jamie Chadwick certainly would have done. She's won a W Series three times over. She's got at least £750,000 in prize money waiting around. But she could have taken that and put it into... It would have been a fairly naf seat. I can't deny that. But it's a seat in a major series in front of a lot more people than W Series are getting in front of. And that would have really kicked things off. But instead, they've gone with Roy Nassani. They've just taken the easy money, the easy way out and gone... Well, we filled our two seats, led us back into Formula led us into Formula Two for this year. And Formula Two's gone, in you come. Thank you very much for your money. And it's just annoying. Don't Jacob, do it. Jacob, as the uh, president of the Roy Nassani fan club, I'll allow you to rebut now. Well, I think this fan club will be coming to an end after this year because I can't see it lasting much longer. We hope 
but for Timo's sake anyway. But I think this should be Roy Nassani's last year in the series. And if it is, it should, then... it should be, but it's probably not going to be. Oh no, he's got he's got a couple more years left in him yet. He must be racking up the years. But um P nineteen overall I'm looking at here, it's just it's just terrible, really. And um, that's before I even get on to Brad Benavides, nice guy he may be. But Roy Nassani is is been there and he hasn't done it, and he's been there for far, far, far too long. And he's you know, kind of the Lance stroll really of um of F2, I think Lance is a better driver in him, but I think, you know, to the answer bar to is him, low. Yeah, the bar is very, very low. Um, yeah, it's all about money, really, isn't it? That's the only reason this Nassani's there. His, um, I think his dad actually had a test years ago with the Minardi team in 2005, just simply yes. because he had a lot of money. I think his brother's had a test somewhere. I think, somewhere raced, I think he raced for Minardi at one point. His dad. And, uh, I think he got made it into a Friday practice, and I think um, Bernie told him to get out of the car and cut it short because he was... 12 seconds off the pace in Budapest. <laughs> oh, so uh, very much Roy is basically following his footsteps of occasionally doing an FP1 session for Williams being 12 seconds off the pace and making Latifi look quick. Yes. Don't just my boy Latifi. That's no, that's no shade against Latifi. Latifi, a very good driver. I'm not entirely certain what he's doing with himself this year. Probably having a year off, enjoying himself. He's covering on the podcast at some point. I'm going to make it happen. Please. Canadian Grand Prix. He's our special guest. But going I'm going to put the question to you two, though, then, because I feel like this is going to be a mean question. I'll start with you, Jacob, as you were going to say about Benavides anyway. Who's finishing on top out of uh, these two? Nisani's finishing on top of Benavides, but it's going to be another sausage curb involved incident. <laughs> Benavides finishes ahead of Nisani because Nisani gets banned for another um, car on top of head moment. Yeah, like the ultimate reality is probably Brad Benavides might outshine this army is it done on count back because we don't actually have any points to measure it by yeah it'll be a case of well you have at least 14 finishes in this like uh, like some 14 finishes and you've only got there it's gonna be it's just gonna be a nightmare please make one of them go away i think all their money this year that they're going to bring in is just going to be spent repairing the car so you know they might not even make it to abu dhabi let's be honest the catering budget for i'll move on to phm is fantastic (laughs) (laughs) i'll move on to trident We've got a rookie there and a uh, quote-unquote experienced driver. So we've got Roman Stanek, though, who is the rookie from F3. He got one win last year in Imola and a further three podiums to finish in that sweet spot that is P5. That means he just about gets away with it in my book. And then, as we alluded to much earlier on the podcast, we have Clement Novelak, who got one podium last year. It was a P2 in Zandvoort and finished P14 overall. Jacob, before the man that likes him way, way too much and probably needs intervention about it, just to talk about it. What do you think about these two go together? I think it's a it's a fairly decent lineup. It's not going to you know set the world alight, but at the same time, I think they'll produce certain certain results. I like Sanic actually. You know, I think he comes in with a fairly good record in F three. Picked up one win last year in Imola, which is a fairly decent win. Three podiums as well. And he kind of reminds me of Fittipaldi in a way. You kind of forget about Sanic. You kind of forget about Fittipaldi. But once you look at the table and actually you know break down these race results, they're actually there or there about. So I think for a Trident team who don't normally set the grid alight, I think he'll pick up a few podiums. Not sure he'll pick up a win, but as for Novelak, you know, to go back to our first team that we reviewed um, in MP, the only reason, I'm sorry to say this, Jesse, that he's down to Trident is not because he knows something or not because there's a lucrative offer on the table. It's because he just wasn't good enough to keep the MP seat. So one podium overall, not really good enough in F2, P14 overall compared to P... You know, when we compare that to Drogovic, you know, he was 99 points ahead of his nearest competitor in P2. So to be 14 places below that just, you know, shows his talent really and... He never really set the world like an F3 either. So, you know, it's going to be, you know, best of the rest sort of stuff for Novelak. Like, you know, the odd points finish here and there. But, you know, we're certainly not going to be mentioning his name much in the podcast next year. Well, you might be, Jesse, but, you know, I don't think many other people will be. I will be sensible for a moment and put on my lateral thinking hat and just say, Novelak, like, there is possibly a good driver in there, but I don't think single seaters are the right approach for him. Um, maybe a different racing series might work. We'll wait and see. But yeah, his performance last year left a lot to be desired. And I don't think it helps that he was up against the guy that won the championship and by such a huge margin to the nearest guy in the field, let alone against his own teammate. It, it's tricky to have any semblance of looking competent against that. And I hear Demolition Derbies are looking for more drivers. Maybe, maybe they are. I don't know. There's 
there's something on the cards for Novelek. I think there's enough charisma and enough driving ability in there to get himself into something, but I don't think it's going to be much beyond this year in F2. I wouldn't be surprised if he has to find something else to do in 2024. So Stanek, um, we had a lot of good things from Stanek last year in F3. He is likely going to show up in Novelek. Um, I think I'm right in saying, was Roman Stanek one of those drivers that really surprised at the Hungarian Grand Prix last year? Was he one of the ones that had that sort of I mad final bit? Yeah, but for some, the, the tyres just came into the right window and he proved that through a crazy field he could whip his way through. I vaguely recall him. He, was, he wasn't the top it. one for that, I don't think, but he got he, he Yeah, he sort of managed to make I, the call and I... get it, yeah. Um, but yeah, I think there's every chance he is likely going to outshine Clement Novelak here, and it'll be annoying. I like Novelak; he's a fun character. I like his podcast, but at the end of the day, this isn't Formula Podcast. This is Formula Two, and if you're not very good at I, Formula I, I Two, I think your problem, Jesse, is that you just need to choose better drivers to support. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> we'll move on to VAR, which. Uh penultimate team on this list don't worry listener we're nearly there Richard Vashore one win last year in Bahrain plus another three podiums but only finished P12 overall which kind of shows how mm, the season was last year but then partnered with him returning to Formula 2 is Juan Manuel Correa who got a podium in Zandvoort last year curiously his first podium in F3 which scratches my head a bit there finished P13 overall but as we say back to F2 after obviously being out for a bit and then going to F3 after all the spa business. Quite uh, looking forward to see how he's going to do, Jacob, in, in Formula 2. And I'm not sure with for sure how, which was not intended to be rhyming, but uh, yeah, I'm not sure how that's going to go. I could see Correa doing pretty well there, but maybe he needs a season to get back into it, whereas for sure... It's at least his second season, if not his third. I can't remember off the top of my head. Maybe one of you two will correct me in a second, but it uh, could be could be another juicy team up. It's certainly one that can't be called easily, and it could come down to a toss of a coin. But I'm verging on the side of for sure finishing ahead, just maybe because it might take one well career a little bit of time to get up to speed. You know, he didn't have the greatest season last year in F3, but I think we can put all of that aside, you know, to you know stop looking at results maybe and just talk about a good news story here of him coming back to F2. I think after what happened in Spa, I think, you know, four years later to come back and see him back on an F2 grid where he belonged at the time is just a great story. And I think, you know, I, everyone, I go for everyone on this podcast today and, you know, everyone listening as well, that, you know, we'd love to see, we're loving seeing him back in F2. And I think it's just, you know, I think the whole world's going to be behind him. So every good result he gets, I'm certainly going to be a one man well career fan next year, regardless of how well he does. But once we bring it down to the results, I think the Vashore might slightly edge it. I think Vashore's actually quite a good driver. I think the win in Bahrain showed his quality. I think as the season went on, I don't think he had the chance, maybe. I think a few of the other teams maybe sort of improved their performance a little bit more, so we never got to see that quality. I think he's a great driver without, you know, he's a good driver without being a great driver, but he can get results. But I just think it will be that, you know, that first few months that we see up to the summer break, whereby Pamel one man well career will be slightly off the pace. So for sure in that time might have built a bigger points gap. But I think it would certainly be close. No, definitely. And like you, like you say, it's uh, there's some circumstances last year for for Korea that didn't allow him to maybe show his potential as much, but he's either kind of just not quite there yet. But again, it, it's going to be a very good way to assess if he is jumping in the deep end as such with F2 again, or if he's really ready for it. But I would, I'm going to be on the side of, of optimism there and say he's definitely up for it. So um Fingers crossed on that one. I don't know if he's going to beat Vashore, but again, if we, you can see that even when Vashore has some good stuff going for him, it doesn't necessarily translate into being great over an entire season. There's, yeah, Vashore has his good moments, but I don't think he's got the ability to pull that out all season long. And I think I'm right in saying that his win in Bahrain came out of some fairly unique circumstances as well. It was a bit chaotic. I definitely remember the opener of the season for pretty much all three tiers of Formula Racing last year was a bit chaotic in Bahrain. So, mm, will Richard Vershaw outscore Correa? I don't think so. I think Correa is going to have steady consistency through the first half of the season where he gets back into the swing of F2, gets back into things. Then once we get to the second half of the season, I can see him hoovering up a lot more points than Vershaw and coming out on top. And it's weird that he scored his first podium in F3 last year. 
Um, means he somehow made it through F3 into F2 without scoring a podium in the prior season. Um, but yeah, return unless to it F2. was counted as GP3 back then, in which case everything's still on board. That's possible. Yeah, he did get a GP3 podium. I think. I think that's how it's counted. But I might be wrong. In which, if it's GP3 podium, in which case that's fair enough. But yeah, return to F2. It's it's good to see him back. There was a lot of promise with him as a driver, and I reckon we'll see some interesting things from him. And Will he make it to F1? I don't know. That's not the question we're asking, but I think there are circumstances that could see no. him appearing on a Formula One grid at some point in the future. I don't think it'll be for a top tier team, but I think he might get his shot. Is well, it going to be sure. doing a grid walk and Martin Brundle talks to him? I don't mm, No, It'll be in a car, <laughs> in a car racing. Safety car? No. <laughs> we'll go on to the final team then, which... Interesting team up as well, this one. It's kind of one smacks of money and the other one smacks of money, but in a more impressive way. We've got Kush Miney, who is the last rookie to be on the grid for 2023. Indian driver, one podium at Hungary last year, but P14 overall in Formula 3. He's going to be partnered with Ralph Boschlein, who is back again because the man just does not stay down. He got two podiums last year, Imola and Spa. And okay, P15 overall, but he was missing for a good amount of races last year due to injury. So it's not totally reflective of his capabilities. And he is a very quick driver on his day. Again, for F2, I think that's probably as far as Boshong's going to make it. Kushmini shouldn't be there. Again, nice guy, but I wonder if this is because we don't have any drivers from that part of the world in going up through the ranks. And if it's just... Uh, a way to help with with marketing and these kind of things, which makes it sound bad, but it's kind of I'm just saying what everyone else is probably thinking. And if he had finished in the top five last year, then I would have absolutely no problem with it. It's just when you're below that that threshold, it does raise questions. And I would love to be proven wrong. I'd like him to come to F2 and suddenly be be getting in the top ten at least fairly regularly and getting. You know, if he finished P10, P12 overall at the end of the year, I'd be like, you know what, not too bad because depending on who else you would have got to replace him instead, it might not have been that much different. But uh, I still think Boshong is going to trounce him. Yeah, I think so too. I think Boshong comes with that level of experience. I think this is, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, guys, but maybe a sixth year, a fifth or sixth year in Formula 2. So without even looking at the entry list, you just know that Ralph Boschong is going to appear there somewhere or throughout the season. So it just comes, you know, part and parcel of the fabric of what makes up an F2 season. But um, coming back to Kush Miney there, I think, you know, Timo, I do like those points you make actually about the um, the marketing. You know, we did have an Indian Grand Prix years ago. We've had obviously Karim Chandok on the grid. We've had Narain Carter Khan as well. So potentially they are trying to sort of rebuild what is a, a massive sort of untapped market in the current formulas. You know, we've got a billion people over in India there and with F1 and F2 growing so much with Liberty Media and everyone else, it might be a way to sort of spark interest there again. So I like where you went with that, but that'll be the only reason alongside money again, we keep talking about money, but money talks sadly. And there's nothing on the uh, racing side that makes me think that, well, you know, let's promote into F2 because finishing P14 overall with that podium, which my memory serves correct. I'm guessing it might have been that um, that crazy uh, last few minutes in Hungary, if I'm right, um, whereby they came to the field. Um, but yeah, nothing that really jumps off the page there from Kush Mani. I think it wasn't his brother in F, was it Arjun Mani? Was it his, in F2 at one point as well? Or was he in F3? I can't remember. You're but... testing my memory a bit too much there, unfortunately, Jake. I was just going to make yeah, the point think... of that, like you say, India, it's it's a lucrative market. And then they just had the Indian Racing League there at the tail end of last year to really get back into single-seater racing and try and promote some of the, the drivers from within. So maybe this is a way of helping that and some of the drivers that are there to progress maybe up into F3 or some of the F4 categories in Europe and, and the Middle East a bit. And just to show that with him, even if he's not going to be the driver to, to do the Kroon Chandok and make it all the way, he can open the doorway for some other drivers and and maybe give them some advice moving on. But in terms of actual performance in Formula 2, I think if he gets the chance to drive again in 24, that is going to be the soonest we see anything properly good from him. He'll finish, he'll finish 19th out of 20, I think. I think Benavides <laughs> takes that uh, bottom place. Nissan is going to finish higher than him. Uh. Well, 18th maybe um, <laughs> and then we'll have to put Cordial 17th and the rest is an absolute toss up we don't know about the rest but those are solid we like to predict things differently on this podcast <laughs> 
I think when it comes to looking at Indians in motorsport, hey, you you cannot forget Mahavir Raghunathan, especially when it comes to talking about F2 you and can try. high quality drivers. Um, but uh, fourteen point turn in Baku, or cutting the entirety of um, Sander Vot in Monaco, iconic, iconic scenes from the man. Um, but got an F1 test though. He still somehow did and was at one point in the running to fill in one of the Alfa Romeo seats last year. Um, Very strange. But anyway, yeah, Kushmani, interesting promotion. Um, There's talent there. Is there enough talent that's worthy of being promoted to F2 at this stage? No. No. Um, Ralph Boschong is a name that just keeps appearing in F2. It's not as infuriating as Roy Nassani, but he does um, smack a bit of the Black Knight from Monty Python in that he's very good at what he does, but also maybe learn when uh, you're not. Like, what is your purpose here? Because you're not going to get to F1, so maybe look somewhere else and yeah. free up a seat for someone who could be going there. Um, has he heard of DTM? He, he, he strikes me as a driver that might enjoy German touring cars. I don't know. It, just something with a bit more sort of crash bang wallop to it might be more Boschong's flavor. But um, I don't know. He, Campos is not a team that I'm going to be watching with great anticipation this year. I don't think they've got a driver lineup to merit it, and I really don't think they've got a sort of technical drive to to work, make it worthy. I think including them last on our list was, if anything, a, a solid prediction. Save the best till I, last. <laughs> I, I put it to both of you then. We've got nine rookies on the grid for 2023 out of 22 drivers, plus a couple extra drivers who we don't think should be there anyway. If you could both choose two drivers from anywhere else in motorsport, but obviously there's going to be a cutoff point because of age and experience and the fact that it's almost two, which two drivers would you have preferred to see in instead? Because I feel like we could do several more drivers than just two, but I'll limit it to just two and hopefully we get some variety. So I'm going to make me and Jesse pick on you first. You don't have to say who they replace or which team they go in, but which two drivers would you have preferred to see in Formula 2 for 2023? Um. Okay, I'm saying chuck in a Colton Herta. I'm going to go immediately pluck someone okay. from IndyCar. I want to see what he does when he's given F1-esque machinery. He's given something that's a little different. I reckon there's there's something there that's worth sort of experimenting with over in the, I don't want to say European sort of motorsport world, but compared to IndyCar, it's very much the sort of, it's fancy shirt-wearing European cousin. Um, I think equally at the same time, I think that uh, maybe one of the W Series drivers really ought to have gotten a call up in place of not Pick necessarily one. some of the rookies. Oh, um, oh, you're going to make me pick, aren't you? Yeah. Um, it's 2023. Um, I've not changed my personality. It's just a new year. I'm still going to be mean. Oh, I don't want to say Chadwick. I think she's got a lot <laughs> to go for her in IndyCar. She does. I feel that I'm, I'm tempted to say... Um, Alice Powell. <laughs> it would have been interesting to see what Alice Powell could do in F2 machinery. I've got to agree. The word domination springs to mind. I reckon she'll come in with just a no-nonsense attitude and just mop the floor with a hell of a lot of people. And I'm very much here for that. On a more realistic level, uh, Abby Pulling. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Tr- Alice Pulling, the master for the apprentice there. Yeah, Alice Powell's mini-me, I reckon, would have done very well if she'd got or will would do very well if she got an F2 seat this year. I know she's going into an F4 thing, I think I read the other day. I can't remember what she's up to at the moment. Um we'll have to circle back around to that at some point in the future yeah. and double check that. I'm sure we'll figure out. I'll, Jacob, I'll find I'm out gonna, what it is. Uh, Jake, I'm gonna push you for two different drivers. Well I'm gonna go completely out of the box here and people might think, well what the hell is this all about? But I'm gonna say two drivers I want to see on the grid. I'm not putting my Hoover back in the car. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go with I'm going to say I would have liked to see on the grid again Logan Sargent because maybe he's not ready for F1 yet I think that Ooh. there's it's something, something about him that really smacks of a good driver I think there is some really good potential there and I think maybe promoted too early so that might hinder him in the future and I think we could have seen a very good season it'd be interesting to see what he could have done with another year in F2 and I know that's slightly out of the box but I think that might have helped him what we want you for here Jacob that's why we book you in so yeah, Logan Sargent is my first one. And looking at the F3 list from last year, obviously we've had drivers finishing as low as 23rd, making it in, so the bar is very low. I'm going to go with someone, you know, if you're going to promote someone from 23rd, why not chuck in, you know, Kyle Collette. Two wins last year, I think finished eighth. 
I think he will benefit from another year in F3. But at the same time, you know, if we are going to promote drivers, you know, with far less capabilities than him, I think that, you know, maybe drivers like that would think that maybe I've been a bit hard done by. So, and I like Kyle Collette as well. He's a nice guy. He's got some good racing talents as well. So, yeah, why not go with Kyle Collette? I've got to agree with that one as well. It did surprise me that he wasn't making the step up when other drivers, like you say, who finished far below him, both in F2 and F3, got a, got a chance to stay there. So, yeah, no, solid choice there. As for me, I'm going to go out the box again, which isn't too surprising, and say two W Series drivers, because I think if they don't get a seat in F3, because there's still a couple of seats going there, but uh, I, I would be happy to see them there. But if not, I think both of the drivers from the Court Dow team in W Series, so that would be Marty Garcia and Fabian Wallwend, would be quite good there. They've both got a decent amount of experience. Fabian's been in some endurance racing as well, if I'm remembering correctly, just briefly, but again, it gives you that little bit of edge. And Marty's just quick. And I just think sticker in F2 car, she's clearly hungry for that that next thing and she's got that that need for speed she's got the the spanish racing in her that i very much associate with the carlos Sainz and fernando alonso's so i would have quite like to see again if you're gonna just stick them in a campus or you're gonna stick them in a charuse a phm racing then why not at least take a chance with it because you know what you're gonna get at uh, phm this year whereas if you put those two in the car instead yeah you might get the same thing but you also really might not, and that could be quite tasty and just open so many doors, not only for them, but for all the other drivers and really show that W Series was able to do something. And even if it didn't come back, it would at least show that these experienced drivers who are a little older than some of the rookies that were in the last year, it's not all doom and gloom for them in the future. No, no. I mean, the, the point you landed on is perfect, and I think it... it... It leads on to one of those things that we could argue about until the cars come home. We're not necessarily argue about because we always find ourselves talking about on the same side of the argument. We just sort of come at it from different points or have different sort of opinions as to how that end point should be reached. Is the fact that W Series has proven a lot, but at the same time has proven very little. It's proven that there is a brilliant crop of female drivers out there, but for some reason they just don't seem to be able to get into the bigger series of F3 and F2. And I think that um, F3 just, with a few shot, slots still open has the potential to really show something for it and get a few of those, snap up a few of those drivers. F2 possibly missed a trick by having where some of the teams didn't go for arguably better choices than they had. PHM, I'm looking at you. Very much like PHM, Formula 2, do better. F3, if you're listening, you've still got a chance. Come on, make it happen. Oh, what, seven seven or six seats left to announce. So, you know, fingers crossed something could still come good there. I'll be optimistic, but not too optimistic because mm, I still don't think it's going to happen, unfortunately. And on that unfortunate sombre note, that is all we have time for on this week's episode. But fear not, we will be back very soon with some more off-season content for you. And Jesse, if the people who are listening to this back at home or wherever the hell they're listening to this want to, for some reason, hear and see more of you, where can they find you? You can find me uh, in Classic Car Weekly. I'm still employed there, um, much to many people's amazement. He says in his big surprise, yes. Indeed. Yeah, um, but yes, I'm still writing there, still doing the events listings, still going off and doing interesting events here, there and everywhere. So if you're out and about doing sort of classic events across this year, chances are you'll probably bump into me. You've got several Jacob. options there. <laughs> Where can the people find you in the meantime? Well, the listeners of this podcast will know if you've seen me on here before that you'll find me down the pub. But this month you won't because it's January and I'm trying to be a little bit good. So I'm trying to cut off. So you won't. No, Timo, it's been 21, mm, 14 days. I'm one week ahead. (laughs) Um, Maybe 17 days. Who knows? The time's marching on. But yeah. Drink a lot to your mind like that. This month. But you will find me on Twitter probably ranting and raving about certain things that are happening during the F1 world currently that frustrate me quite a lot. Andretti, <clears throat> cough, 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 cough. So yeah, Jacob Phil over on eight, uh, at Jacob Phil 18 over on Twitter there if you want to follow me. But yeah, next month down the pub, guys. If you happen to be in a pub somewhere in the country, I might be there. As for myself, you can find me in all good retailers such as Is It Fast, On The Curbs, Paddock Sorority, Paddock Passion, Instagram, and the Nitro RX podcast where we have some really fun interviews coming up, including with the one and only legend of the district, Bike Tommy, which even if you've got nothing to do with a Nitro RX, that is just going to be a fun listen. He is a crazy, crazy dude. Anyway, as we've said before, we shall be back with some more Formula 1, Formula 2, Formula 3 feeder series content very, very soon. Thank you very much for listening and we shall talk to you again soon.